Good stock is the foundational element to so many dishes, regardless of what cuisine it comes from. And in Chinese cuisine, there are a couple of stocks that are taken even further beyond what your general beef or chicken stock would be. One of them is called the master stock, a braising liquid that you reuse over and over again until eventually you might have something that you will be passing down for generations. And superior stock, which is what we're making here, a broth base that is made up of many high quality ingredients and is the foundation of what is going to be your best broth and your best braise. It is the stock a cook will use when they want to put their signature on something. There are three main components to a superior stock. You've got the raw meat, you have the cured meat, and you have the aromatics. Pork neck bones and stewing hens are oftentimes the base in the raw meat portion. Stewing hens are older chickens whose meat are not tender enough to be used in a regular sense like roasting or frying, but the meat has so much flavor in it, it makes it perfect for soup and broth. The cured meat section is a little more open. A lot of people use different things based on their own preferences or how they want their broth to taste. I use Chinese salted pork that also has black peppercorns in it, as well as a ham called Jinhua ham, which is like the Chinese answer to a barico. If you can get your hands on like a really nice ham bone, that could be a perfect substitution for either of these things. Finally, for the aromatics, I only use ginger and scallions, but I split them up into two sections. There is the raw ginger and scallions, and then there is ginger and scallions that have been roasted in ginger scallion oil. Once you have all these components ready, the process is pretty simple. First thing you need to do is poach your raw components. That's the neck bones and the chicken. Starting with cold water, add your chicken and neck bones and bring that to a boil for about three minutes. What you're essentially trying to do is cook out all of the scum that floats to the surface. It's harmless, but it makes for a really cloudy broth in the long run. And while I'm personally not certain, I'm pretty sure that that foam is also responsible for a lot of the more gamey flavors that come out of your meat. Once that is done, dump out all the water and wash the pot so that none of the residual scum goes into your clean broth. I take the extra step by rinsing off and scrubbing off all of the excess scum from the bones and the chicken by hand under some cold tap water. You don't have to do that though. And then in a fresh pot of cold water, adding all your meat, your cured meat, and your aromatics and bringing that up to only a simmer. You will be leaving them all in here for at least five hours. In today's side quest, we are gonna go over the ginger scallion oil that I used for the broth earlier. Because a lot of people seem to know about this stuff but aren't really sure as to how to make it. First thing you need to do is peel some ginger and do yourself a favor and buy like the big pieces of ginger that you can get at ethnic grocery stores. Do not trust any grocery store that tries to pass off tiny little nubbins as proper pieces of ginger because they are lying to you. For this recipe, I would say you would need five or six large thumb sized pieces of peeled ginger. Next thing to do is to take off all the wilted stalks from your scallions and you'll need about 15 or 16 full stalks of scallions. A lot of people at this point will put the scallions in a food processor. I don't really like doing that because of the way that it shreds the leaves. I just like to slice them all very, very thinly and then give the ends a good little rough chop. I believe that not only does it make your ginger scallion oil a little more aesthetically pleasing, but I do feel like it does also alter the taste a bit. There is a pungency difference when you just chop your scallions. Now, when it comes to chopping your ginger, I really couldn't give a f as to how you get that done. With your ginger and scallions thoroughly mixed, the next thing you need to do is salt them. Oils don't really do a good job in carrying flavor very well. Aroma, they're good, but flavor, not so much. If you ever try to add salt to a sauce that is, say, oil-based, you'll find that the absorption rate is not very good. So the way that we get around that is adding salt to the ginger and scallions. What that will do is it will draw all the water out, absorb with that water, and then infuse back in. So you'll have really flavorful ginger and scallions, and that in turn, will make the oil flavorful. Here you can see me eyeball how much oil to use and think, oh, maybe I should measure this out before I do a video recipe on it. I'm guessing it's about a quart and here's me measuring out an exact quart that I eyeballed and being really, really proud of it. Now preheat your oil to about 350, 375 degrees before dumping that over your ginger and scallions. When you make ginger scallion oil this way, the oil will keep in your fridge for at least three weeks. It might solidify a little bit, but it'll still be good. This oil is fantastic on dishes like poached chicken or steamed chicken. It's famously used in a dish called Hainan chicken rice. 
Another great use for it is to put it on top of your dumplings or to mix it in with a bowl of noodles. It is a super versatile condiment. And here you can see me filter out the solids because I'm going to use it for something a little bit different. Normally you don't do this. You leave the solids in and you just serve it as a whole oil and paste, but you'll see in the next video what I use it for. This ginger scallion oil is what I use to roast the ginger and scallions for the broth. It's not a traditional use for it, but there's nobody here to tell me what not to do. Now it's been five hours and our stock is ready. Here you can see me slightly loopy because I actually started this stock way too late in the day and I am very sleepy. You can see the stock has taken a deeper, darker color. A lot of it has to do with the roasted aromatics, but if you put your spoon through it, you can see undoubtedly that it still remains to be very clear. Now, one optional finishing component to a lot of people's superior stocks is actually a seafood element. Because of its pungency, elements like dried shrimp and fish are oftentimes left for the last 30 minutes of poaching in the superior stock. My version uses two handfuls of dried scallops, but I do think dried shrimps are the more common one. What this does to the broth is give it a little bit of umami lift, but keep in mind you're not trying to make a seafood stock, so you don't want it to taste fishy at all, which is why you only do it for 30 minutes. Everything that you cook in the stock can be eaten, but honestly, there is no flavor left. So if you're gonna eat any of this stuff, like put it in a lettuce wrap or something, it's totally fine, it's just boiled meat, but make sure you salt it first. Because of the more fragile elements in here, you generally don't wanna reduce it too much. For storage, what I like to do is put it into smaller quart containers and then freeze those so that I can use them pre-portioned as needed. Now, what's important to note here is that at the end of the day, this is still a stock. I know this took all of this work, but it's still not finished. So what I did here was just cook my stock with a little bit of tomatoes and some dumplings to turn the stock into a full and very satisfying broth. The reason why I don't put any kind of spices or herbs in the stock as I'm making it is because those components are still too delicate. They won't keep for very long. So say you wanted to use this as a base for a wonton noodle soup or a ramen broth. It will still need the nuance that comes from the more delicate spices and aromatics. But when combined with those things, it will without a doubt leave you with the best version of any dish that you want to make that uses stock. Though I haven't tried it, I think that it is possible to make this in an instant pot or a, some kind of automatic pressure cooker. I do plan on trying that in the future, so stay tuned for when I share my results.